Okay, um, Happy New Year. Today is the 1st of 2024, so um, wishing you all a Happy New Year. Hopefully it all goes well for everybody. This is a quick video, I hope, um, just showing how to or how I archive documents. So this is a arcade manual, which I purchased on Facebook Marketplace, just flicking through it here. And I bought it for one reason mainly. I don't actually have this game. I have the monitor, the MS9 monitor. And you'll see here, I'm just going to flick through from the back and just try and find the starting page of the MS9 manual. Because unfortunately, the online version is really poor quality. And uh, this is an original Sega, ugh, Sega manual. And I managed to get it for £40 to get this monitor manual so that I can scan and upload it to archive.org and the Wikipedia pages and help people. So you can see here, uh, here is the details of the Nanyo monitor. And that's the thickness of the document there. It's about 29 pages, I think, with a fold out schematic at the back. The only online scan I can find of this it's typical of the age. That has been reduced down to A4 paper and then sort of scanned up. So when you look at it on a surface value, it looks fine. However, in actual fact, it's unreadable. You can't read any of the values. So this is me showing now. Um, this is in my parents' house, which is why it's a bit different. Uh, this is me showing how to remove the staples to get the document apart. And I just use a little flat-bladed screwdriver to lift up that staple. Uh, the left staple, or sorry, the right staple uh, lifts okay, but the left staple was quite rusty, so it actually ends up snapping in a moment. But uh, the essence is, is we, we want to try and not damage the document uh, as much as we can. So lift the staples into an upright position, and then shortly we shall be lifting the pages off of the staples, which I'll show you next. So here I am about to show lifting the pages off and I just do this one page at a time, just gently, just prise it off of the staples. You can see here there's one and then I'll just continue through the entire 29-30 pages of this back part of the document. So here's the document now, uh, removed from the, the larger document and you can just see all the different pages here and because it was a stapled document, and obviously this was the 90s, it's been stapled for a long, long time. Um, what you'll find is when you try and scan it through a dock feeder, sometimes the pages will get pulled through together. So what I like to do is just um, sort of fan the document out, flick through from both sides, and just try and break those pages apart. So you can see here I am going through the entire document so that they're all completely... Um, separate pages, you know, that the air has been able to get between the joins. And this is me just counting out how many pages there are. Uh, the reason I do this is the dock feeder, the dock feed scanner that I'm using is my parents' uh, scanner. And it's not fantastic. Uh, it can pull through the pages at the same time. So what I'm doing here is counting through the pages, which I say was about 29 pages or so. And then I know that we're doing double-sided scanning, so say it was 30, for example, well, we're, we're expecting 60 pages then. And um, when the final scan comes in, if it's not 60 pages, then I know that some pages have been missed, and I need to go through and check that, um, just for reference for you guys. Uh, the only thing left to say here is the last document, of course, is the schematic. That's just me airing out the pages as much as I can. And the schematic... Uh, I'll have to scan that separately because it's bigger than A4, and I'll show you that as well. So here we are looking at the dock feeder scanner. It's a UTAX or something like that. I can't quite make that out here, but whatever it is, it's a pretty crummy brand. Um, but it will do what I want. It's an A4 dock scanner. Uh, I'm just going to run through and show you some of the first things you need to do to, if you're doing this yourself with your own dock feeder, just to make sure you get a good scan. So the first thing to do is to lift up this top lid here and just check the rollers, check all the guide rails. Um, just use a duster there, just get in there. And uh, make sure that 
there's no paper dust, there's nothing obstructing any of the, the guides or any of the uh, rollers. And this is to try to avoid that thing that I was telling you about, which is um, getting a two pages pulled through at once. So once you've um, cleaned that top area of the dock feeder, how they work is they're also flatbeds, you can see this, but this thing I'm pointing to on the side there, that's where the dock feeder gets scanned. And you only need a small speck of paper dust or anything there, and you'll get lines down your scan. So I'm just using the cloth here just to dust that off, get any dust that's any debris that's fall, fallen onto that and get that out. So with that out of the way, it's now time to stack the paper as best as I can there, pop it in the dock feeder. This particular one works text side up. That's me just adjusting the guide rails there. Because you, you want to try and make sure the paper's pulled through as straight as possible. You don't want it on a slant. Um, so just squeeze in those guide rails. This thing is so crap that <laughs> the guide rails expand out again so it becomes loose the longer you run it. But anyway. So here we are looking at the um, touchscreen for this particular printer scanner. I'm just going to click send because I'm trying to send this over the network to a computer. I'm just going to block that out, but uh, that's just selecting the computer in question that it's going to send it to. And uh, then this is not the most intuitive menu in the world, um, but we'll have a quick look at it. You you click at the bottom what you want. So it's currently defaulting to color. We will say black and white because it's a black and white document. And then I think you need to click functions. It's You can see me struggling to work out what I'm doing with this damn thing. So click function, and then you've got the options to customize how you want to scan. So we'll say black and white. Uh, file format is going to be TIFF, because uh, that's the format I want to use. Obviously, it's going to be A4, which is fine. Uh, the orientation is fine. Duplex, so that's double-sided scanning. So you can see I'm going to say two-sided for duplexing scanning. And then it's interesting here you can do scan resolution and we'll say 600 dpi because I want a high quality scan. You've also got the option here for file separation, which I hadn't noticed before, and that would allow it to be singular page TIFFs. But for this process, we'll do it to one massive TIFF and I'll show you how you pull that apart in case you have this problem yourself. Looking at the other options, there's nothing there that needs to be changed. So we will click close. And then you press the green start button on this particular model to start the scan. So I'll show you that. So here you can see it's sped up, but this is just the document flying through the dock feeder now. You may notice the paper seems to come in and out a lot in the bottom rather than going in at the top. That's the duplexing. It has to turn the page around to scan the other side. So it takes a little while to do that before it can feed it through. Fortunately, um, whatever I did did the trick because this time it pulled through every page correctly. So good work. Okay, so here we have the scanned document now. This is on now home. This is on the Mac. And I will just have a quick flick through this multi-paged TIFF is what they call this. And uh, you know that the first page looks okay. Second page doesn't look too bad. Third page, mm, that's on a funny angle. <laughs> that looks to be on a funny angle. That's not too bad. That's on an angle, on an angle, on an angle. And then we get to this. Now, obviously this is what I'm calling an original document from Sega in the UK. Um, but this clearly was scan after scan after scan. And you can tell that because if you flick through to one of the pages, uh, which one is it now? This one. You can see there's actually a sort of fold line across the document. And that's not me. That's from something else. So this is clearly at least a, a second copy of a scan or a, a photocopy probably back in the day. I, I can imagine somebody sat in an office with an old photocopier just churning through this. It probably wasn't even connected to a computer or anything. It would have been a physical document in the flatbed probably and then do 100 copies of it. Um, but yeah, you can see some of them aren't too bad. And then some of these pages are really on some funny angles. Uh, that one's a particularly brilliant one. So the reason I wanted to show you this process is I've actually wrote some scripts 
to try and sort this out and square it all up. So um, we'll move on to that next. Okay, guys, so we don't need to worry about this too much. This um, this is a GitHub. If you don't know what GitHub is, it's like a code repository thing that you can uh, sign up for free and upload code and just keep it for version retention and that sort of stuff. So um, I'll explain more about this later. But simplistically, this is uh, one of the scripts that I wrote up a little while ago now looking at this. Um, April last year. And... Um, Basically, you can see here this script, personal project, blah, 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 scanning multi-page TIFFs, blah, blah, blah. So as I said before, the TIFF file, the scan, is like a singular um, file, but it's got multi-pages in it. And multi-page TIFF files, you cannot open those in Photoshop, for example, because it would say, this isn't supported. It's actually really tricky to break uh, pages out of a multi-page TIFF. So I wrote this little script to do this. And you can see here, I said, to run the script, you'll need the InfraView graphic viewer from their website. Um, this particular, bleh, particular virtual machine I'm on doesn't have that. So let me go and find that now. So once we're on their main website, we can see that you've got 32-bit and 64-bit versions. My machine is running 64-bit Windows 10. And probably most of you will be in a similar situation. So we will download that. Oh dear, what a horrible website that that's, uh, that brings up. Uh, but it has downloaded it, so let's close off of that. And let's go and find that. So I'm just here in my downloads, and we can see that that has downloaded. So I'm just going to double click that. It's going to give me the option to run that. Um... I will probably say for all users, and it's just easier that way. And I don't want a desktop shortcut. Uh, yeah, that's probably okay. Well, I've read and accepted all of that. Uh, I will leave that as not taking control of anything. That's fine. Don't care about that. Don't particularly care about that. Click done. So I'm guessing that's installed. Oh yes, it is. Perfect. So we're not actually going to learn how to use that. We just need that installed. So back to my script, you'll see once that's installed, it does a few different bits. So we're now going to need the script and we're going to need to create some locations and bits and pieces to be able to use it. So what you'll want to do is download the script, and I'm hoping we can just say download raw file, which you'll see. And yes, that's downloaded the PS1 file, that's uh, PowerShell. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and find that, which is here, and I'm going to cut that out, and then I'm going to go over to uh, the C drive, IT, and then I'm going to paste that in here. You can do it kind of wherever you want, but I like to do stuff in the root of C. It just makes things easy. And we're going to open up that script now. So bear with me on that. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go to your start menu, type PowerShell. Um, annoying. That's because I can't spell. <laughs> uh, there you go. And you'll get uh, Windows PowerShell ISE. And we're going to want to run that as administrator. So you can close that. We don't need, don't care about that. And we're going to want to open that script. So here we go. We can see the script is now open in the editor. Um, I just like this because I can edit the script if need be and also run it. So if we have a look at this script, we can see that it's going to say um, you need to point to where InfraView is installed. So we should double check that's the case, that it is there. And it's saying program files, InfraView... 
i underscore view 64, which it is indeed, so that's fine. That's in its default location. And you can see we're asking for a source and destination. Of course, you can change this to whatever you want, but I'm going to leave it as it is. So um, for the source, I need a folder called source. And I'm going to need a folder called destination. And my multi-page TIFF is obviously going to go in the source, so we'll drag and drop that there. And I validate this script, so hopefully it's pretty self-explanatory what it does. And I think that should allow us to do what we want to do. And um, what we would do is, I'll just talk through this. So top to bottom of this script, obviously a bit of waffle on what you need to do prior to it. Variables, just make sure that you have those locations or you change them to locations that work for you. Set location path, script root. So that just means this will change from C Windows System 32 to CIT because that's where I've saved the script. And then it's a pretty short script. The main loop is just using some PowerShell commands, get child item, and it's going to look in the source for anything with a dot tiff. And it's going to um, take some bits from that, extract it, and then it's going to use this command to, in the destination folder now, make the named TIFF files. So we'll just hit play and see what happens. It doesn't work, yay. Hmm. So that's because we need to set ex execution policies to be allowed. Um, let me just look up that command, bear with me. Okay, so you may want to look into this yourself, of course, because, um, you know, I'm not here to talk to you about security and stuff like that, but you can um, you can run this command here, set execution policy, execution policy unrestricted, and that will undisable the ability to run any sort of scripts. You might want to not do that, and you can just say there's a like a bypass command. You can say just run this script with bypass for now, um, but I don't particularly care, so I will unrestrict that. It will say, are you sure you want to do this? Yes to all. And then if I hit play again... Uh, okay, run once. There we go. So it's now trying to extract it. It's found the document and it's saying done. So that was pretty quick. So let's go and have a look, see what happened. And we have a folder. And look, we have lots of pages. We have 56 pages, which is actually correct. That's the correct number of pages in this document. Um, sure. Yes, there we go. And we can now see we're stepping through all of the individual pages, which is perfect. So my script has simplistically taken the source document and split it apart, which is exactly what we need for the next step. So for the next step, we're going to need one of my other scripts, which is this dsku script. Um, so let's have a look at that one. And that's a similar sort of thing. Um, what do we need for this? We need... Ah, uh, yes, of course. So there's an open source bit of software called DSKU, which this guy made. And um, fair play, it's really, really helpful. Um, so what we can use is, is we can use that to um, sort of straighten up all of those pages automatically. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But what we'll do, we'll download that script as well. So we can see that's done. And we will move that in a second. But we'll also have to go and download... Um, we'll do it from Git. We'll download the latest version of his DSKU. So it's not been updated in a little while, 2019, so it's just here on the right. DSKU1.3.zip. Okay, so we'll wait for this to wake up. There we go. So we'll take the zip and the PowerShell script and we'll cut that and we'll paste that over here. And we will extract that. Um, you can use the built-in Windows extractor or 7-zip. I just prefer 7-zip. So 
perfect. We will cut that out, paste that there, take that and that, and delete those. And there we go. So we've now just got the DSKU folder there and the script. So let's go over to PowerShell ISE. We will open up the script. And let's see what we're saying on this one then. So we're saying, look for that thing in CIT DSKU bin DSKU. So let's just check that's correct. CIT DSKU bin DSKU. That's interesting. Really say DSKU 64 is, oh, okay. Yeah, okay, fine. So because I'm on 64 bit, then that's the one to use. Uh, now the source, it's going to be the extracted pages and the destination will be the straightened pages. So we just need to fiddle around with what we've got here. So I would probably suggest source, we will call source old destination, we'll rename to source and we'll make a new destination. So now we've got the, oh, and actually what we need to do is grab these and just cut them out to the root of source and get rid of that. So there we go. So we've now got the pages in the source. We've now got a destination which is empty. And then if we go and have a look at this script, and I'll just talk you through this, very similar to the last one, we've got some variables at the top which is pointing at the particular application we're using for this, pointing at where your source is, where your destination is, um, sets the route for the script. And then we've got a main loop, which is just going to churn through the source TIFF files. Um, say we're now de-skewing de this page and then runs this command, which is the de-skew64. And uh, that FFF, that's just a white thing. That's um, compression, lazy zeroing or something. Destination, file name, output, and uh, that's it. It will do what it needs to do. So we'll hit play on this. Uh, I'll say run once, sure. And you can see it's now churning through these pages. And uh, it's a bit slower this process because it has to analyze them and try and straighten them all up. So let's wait for this to finish and I'll be back with you. Okay, so if you're lucky, uh, what we should see now is you should see it's gone to done and finished the script. It's just churned through all these pages there. So we'll go ahead and have a little look and compare. Um, so I will open, I'm not sure if it's going to allow me to do this. Um, I will try. Let's see if it will let me open um, two photo viewers at once. It might do. Oh yes. So the left is the before then and the right is after. So page one was fine. I think we said that. Page two was fine. Page three, let's have a look. Yep, so that was fine. I think that was probably the first one that was a little bit on an angle. And yeah, I think Am I imagining this? I don't know. But I think you can see that the right one is a bit straighter than the left one. Same with the next page. Let's have a look. Yeah, I think I would argue that's straighter. That one again. Yeah. And of course, we'll, we'll get to the one where you'll see this is the one where you should see the marked difference and yeah you can see a marked difference there obviously like I say it's an odd scan or an odd copy that that line should have been straight and it isn't and stuff like that but you can see there the table on the left is really on an angle and on the right it looks pretty straight to be quite honest so you can see what this is trying to achieve probably the same with this page as well uh, yeah you can see that that is on an angle that is on less of an angle so it, it does do its thing. Uh, this one is tilted the other way, interestingly enough. So if we can have a look at that. 
yeah, you can see that's on the right there. That's looking <laughs> remarkably straight, to be quite honest, compared to the left image. And that's all automated through scripting. So this is why I love this. It's just because um, you can imagine if you had a big document. Oh, here's a good one. Um, this could take hours to muck about in Photoshop doing by hand. Yeah, look at the difference there. So I think <laughs> I think I've proved my point. It's well worth doing. Um, it's a relatively quick process that you can just uh, get it to automatically churn against a folder of pages. And I think the output is a lot better than had you not bothered. So that is how you de-skew a TIFF file. Okay, guys, it's been a couple of weeks now, actually. Um, since we last spoke, or <laughs> I last spoke for the recording. I've um, been really busy preparing for a holiday. I had a little holiday, just come back, um, just trying to get back into the swing of things. Spent a silly amount of hours on a script, which I'll get into a bit later. But before we get to that, I just want to show how to scan that schematic. So I'm not going to bore you showing you how a flatbed looks, flatbed scanner. I'm sure everybody's seen it before. Um, but this is just a bit of software, which you have to pay for view scan. It's very good for other things to do with uh, photos and what have you. Um, but I use it for this. And we'll just have a quick look. Preview scan, 300 DPI, 600 DPI for the scan. Uh, the only things that are important here is the output is going to be a... T oh, I've also got a cold, <laughs> if I sound a bit weird. Um, the output is going to be a TIFF. It's going to be black and white. It's going to be... Uh, the crop is maximum, so it doesn't crop anything. And the media side is maximum of the bed, just in case it's not quite sitting in there. So we will hit preview. And we can see this is now the first part of the schematic page. And I'm happy with that. It's black and white. It, you know, it's probably fine. We'll have a look at it properly in a second. It's not cropped anything, so we'll hit scan. And now we need to go and look for it. And um, we can see it's... Yeah, it's not as clear as I was hoping. It's not the fault of my scanner, it's the fact that the original is just a reproduction of a reproduction. Um, but that's about as good as, it, as we're going to get from this particular document. You can see the wording, is it looks quite smudged, but it is clear, it is sharp. It's just unfortunate. Uh, also, what the hell is going on there? So I'm just looking at the original in my hand here, and yeah, there's a <laughs> there's a break in the middle of the document when it's been rescanned. Um, even this copy isn't complete; like there's a a complete break, and obviously it's very apparent on the connector there. So unfortunately, I will continue as best as I can, but essentially there's information missing. So we'll have a go at scanning the next part. And what I've done is I've moved the scanner along fractionally because I want to kind of do like half scans to merge it later. So you'll see what I mean in a moment. So you'll see we've moved slightly across. We're kind of halfway through the chip, which is fine. So I'll hit scan and we'll scan that in. And we'll just scan the final part. Uh, I'm just going to hit scan. And that's now the whole page uh, completely finished scanning. So we can close down the software. And go and find our three parts. Um, I'll just call it P1, P2, and P3. And I will make a folder for this, just to make it easier for me. And I'll call it scam, um, scam underscore original. 
I'll we'll drop those in there. I'll move it out to my desktop to make it easier. And there we go. So um, for this, I'm going to use Photoshop. And you could probably use, which is obviously paid for, but you could probably use some alternative software. Um, but I'm going to show you how I would do this in Photoshop. So I'm going to open the document, be back with you. So up to this point, I've been able to use completely freeware software, but this is going to be one of two examples of two pieces of software which are paid for software. Um, like I say, you might want to find alternatives because I, I would prefer to use all open source if I could. Um, so we've got the document open here. I'm just going to go to select and I'm going to press Control A on the keyboard, which will select all. I will then go Control C to copy it. I will then go to new and say, yeah, new from the clipboard. Um, uh, sorry, that was meant to be with a white background. It's because I was doing something else with a black background the other day. So hang on. There we go. And we'll go control V to paste it. And you'll see we've now got a new layer. Um, the background layer I will delete and I will create a new layer which is transparent and put that in the background. So now what we want to do is actually straighten this document out as best as we can. And this will be a similar process to what we've been doing. Um, elsewhere but we'll be doing it with the Photoshop tools to do so what I want to do is I want to zoom in probably not that much and then we want to use the ruler tool which I'm trying to remember exactly where that is yeah here it is ruler tool and then you want to try and click on um, the very edge of one of these lines, click and hold, drag across to the other end of the line, get it as close as you can. So I'm going to say, oh, about there, let go. And then we should be able to hit straighten layer, which isn't working because I've got the wrong layer selected. That's a good start, isn't it? Make sure you've got the uh, image layer selected. So there we go, and you can see it rotated the image a little bit there, which is what we need. So that is now so say straight, of course it's not going to be perfect. Um, I've gone for something in the middle of the page rather than something at the top, in, uh, in hope that that will work. So that's part one done, so I'll close the original part one, and I will go and open uh, part two and do the same thing, so bear with me. So sadly, this is um, going to be a real struggle. If I just pan around this document, you can see I've just tried to straighten it and the, the chip line there at the top doesn't look too bad. But say if you um, kind of aligned to one of these lines here, look at the bow. Um, you can see that line, if it's just touching on the far right over here, and then look at the bow down and then it sort of bows up a little bit. The whole document is bent and wavy from where it's just been scanned after scanned or photocopied after photocopy. Um, so I'm not sure how I'm going to get on with this, but this is the process um, that you would use if you had a better scanned or a better original. So let me do part three. So that's part three there as well. So now what we will do is we will save these amended documents. So we will go save as, go to my desktop, uh, do a new folder, skim, edited. And we want to save these as TIFF files. And we will say P1, 
Uh, I'll uncheck layers, which will merge it. Um, it says copy, that's fine. Uh, image compression, LZW is absolutely fine. So that's saved. We will now close and say don't save changes. Part two, again, save as. We're in that folder. TIFF file, P2, save. Okay. Close. Nope. And then, uh, last but not least, part three. So we're just in Photoshop now with nothing open. And if we're lucky, if we had better documents, this would work, but we'll, we'll see. You would go to File, and then Automate, and then Photo Merge. We're going to say Auto. Are we going to say Auto? Yes, we will try. No, we won't. We'll go to Reposition. We're going to go Browse. We're going to select all three files and click OK. And then we're going to click OK. And you're going to see it's going to open those files and it's going to start mucking about trying to merge them. So let's let that finish. So here we are, it's had a go at merging those three files. And if we just uncheck it, you can see, look at the clever line that is cut across that document, just to try and seamlessly merge it. And you can see the middle scan, it's only a tiny bit that it used, but again, same principle. And the edge, it ended up using quite a straight line. And I think that's the obvious thing is because there was a break in the document in the first place. Um, so sadly, what what we should do is if we zoom in here and then re-add that you can see the join is absolutely seamless like it, it's done a fantastic job of getting that document to join and you really wouldn't know there was a join there Sadly, of course, because <laughs> they didn't have this technology, I suppose, when they did it in the first place. We have this mess of um, a join in the middle, and there's just nothing I can do about that. So, um, that's nothing to do with my archiving, that's to do with Sega back in the day. I, I suppose whilst I'm here, I could um, just cut out some of the dirt that's on this scan. Um, I'm trying to do this through a remote desktop, so I don't know how easy this is going to, I'm going to have to just, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> so um, what we'll do now is if you're happy with what's happened there, uh, select all of the three layers and you can do that. Sorry, just by clicking on the first one, hit select on the key, uh, shift on the keyboard and then press the third one. It will select all of them. And then we just want to merge those layers. Uh, if I can figure out where that button is, merge layers, there it is. And um, we could add a blank layer for the back as well. But now I go back on the merge layer and I just want to see if I can actually cut out some of this. Yeah, I can. And um, if we just painted that back layer white. Um, there we go we can sort of use that to just cut out some of the sort of dirt that's come across because uh, the, the page had actually got a bit damp. That was a watermark. So uh, whilst we're here, might as well just do that. I'm not going to get too excited about it because um, it's a pretty poor quality document, sadly. But that just gives you the idea. All I'm doing here is just selecting and then uh, cutting away. And you could use the delete key, but I can't because of how I'm connected to this machine. Um, and just tidying it up a little bit there. Now, that is where the document's a bit longer than what it was originally. That's the back of my scanner uh, top. So if we go fit to screen, and if we go to the crop tool, what we will do is just drag that in a little bit. 
and say OK. I'm not worried too much about sizing this correctly because it's just you know, such a mess anyway. Um, and we'll just tidy up the end of that part of the page. And we'll just do that part as well. And there we go. I think that's probably enough. I could try and just zoom in on this bottom bit here. But as far as I'm concerned, that's probably about as good as it's going to get. I mean, just look at the state of that. <laughs> it's just, it's not a straight line, is it? You know, it's like a typical uh, British new house build at the moment. I think <laughs> not a straight wall in them. Um, so there we go. That's as, as good as it's going to get. So what we'll do is we will um, save that. So we'll go save as. And we'll just come out to the desktop now and I'll call that schematic. My spelling is terrible. I'm assuming that's correct. We'll untick layers. That will just merge it. Save it as a TIFF. Job done. I was a W is fine for now. Job done. And that's it. That's how you would merge a larger page together that's larger than A4. Okay, guys. So um, I was just looking at that schematic again. Um, I'm not very happy about the bit of the schematic that is missing. So on the arcades, I can never pronounce it, Artiku uh, wikis that I'm trying to support at the moment, there is an old scan that somebody else has put up of the schematics. Now, if we have a look at this, you may be able to see immediately that it is quite um, blurry. And then if we, of course, zoom in, you can see it's essentially unreadable. Um, and it's just too low resolution. But the interesting thing is, is it doesn't have a split where mine has a split. So what I've done is I thought, I wonder if I can crop in, bodge this about a little bit, compare it to what I've got and fill in the blanks. So if we have a look at my document now, what I've done is I've cut out the sort of missing bit. And you can see here, this is essentially what's missing. It doesn't look like a lot, but we are actually missing traces off of the um, schematic. It's just enough that it's missed a line or two. So if I now untick both sides, untick this one. Ah, that's annoying. <laughs> uh, let's tick left as well. There we go. You can see um, essentially where the, the documents join. There's this trace here, this far line, that was missing. Um, and then if I restore the right side, hopefully you can see the difference there. So we're actually missing this join, this trace here. And it's not perfectly aligned, I know. Um, you can see here that these aren't perfectly aligned. And uh, when we get right down the bottom, you can clearly see where the, um, the documents are joining. But I would rather have it like that in the sense of I would rather add the missing information than not. So hopefully that will make this as good as I can make it with what I've got access to. Um, again, I know that it's not fantastic in terms of, you know, can you really read what any of this says? Not really. Um, there's just nothing I can do. It's the document that I've got. So I'm going to resave this now with that little bit that was missing uh, rejoined. And then we'll pick this up next. So I'm back on my virtual machine now. And I've got the schematic here in a new folder that's called Source 1. I mean, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll get to all of this, by the way. Um, but for now, um, what we need to do is this document we've made is... Uh, it has funny compression on it. What has it got? It's got um, LZW compression, which has come from Photoshop, which is fine. Um, it's a lossless compression, but the problem we've got is look at the size of it. 5.91 meg for a singular page. Um, now, what we actually want is we want to match the original um, compression of the original document. So if we go back to source and look at the original multi-page TIFF, we will find, oh look, the document's tiny, and it is this CCITT T.6, which is some sort of lossless but ultra compressed for fax machines, black and white only, one bit, um, 
yeah, <laughs> crazy compression, really, considering it's a 600 DPI document. But that's what we want to match. So I've had to knock up a quick script here, uh, TIFF compress convert. We'll just make sure the converted folder is empty. Yeah. So what I've got is I've got that schematic in here in source one, and I've got a converted folder which is empty. And this little script is just going to say, take the input document and convert it to whatever compression I ask for, which in this circumstance is the uh, fax for conversion. So I'll hit play on that quickly. That script is finished. We'll go in here, and now we'll we see we will see look. 339 kilobytes and um, the format is now the the one we want but it's still a 600 dpi document we haven't lost any resolution uh, it's just the bit depth is now one because it's black and white and what have you and if we have a quick look at that let's see what the end result looks like it doesn't look any different really to what we were expecting i suppose and you can see there's the bit of the document that was originally missing and it's now back in. It doesn't look hugely out of place, to be quite honest. Uh, so there we go. That's as good as I'm going to get it, I'm afraid. So we can now move on to the next step. Right then, guys. So if you've made it this far, thank you for bearing with me. I know this is a dry topic, as is everything I do. <laughs> um, the, the scripts that I've shown so far... Uh, which was, let's think about this now, it was the multi-page TIFF to single-page TIFF extraction. It was the DSKU script, and I think that's how far we got. And then obviously there was the convert script just to convert that schematic. And then the hope is, is that after that we could uh, proceed to push it into a PDF. But what I actually did is I had to stop... Um, I then proceeded to spend probably about 10 hours on building this script on the screen now, which is a unified script which does everything. Then I went on holiday for a couple of days, and now I'm back, and I've probably spent about another 5 to 10 hours on it as well, just trying to refine it, just uh, trying to get it where it needs to be. Um, even to the point that the person that makes the DSKU app, uh, this chap here, where is he? Marek. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I actually had to raise a bug on his GitHub page uh, because I found that it wasn't exporting it or it wouldn't convert to a certain compression of TIFF uh, file. And fair play, credit where credit's due. Uh, in the time of me going on holiday and coming back, he's logged on, commented, fixed it, and pushed it back to his GitHub page with the fix. The only thing he hasn't done is he hasn't actually recompiled the code. So let me just jump into that real quick. Hang on. So if we have a quick look at his uh, GitHub page here, you'll see that release, last release, is 1.3, and it was in 2019. But then if we have a look at his um, sort of commits on the repository, you can see that there was an update last week here, an update last week here, an update last week here, here, here. So lots of things have happened uh, since this version. So, and, and obviously that's the fixes that we need to be able to run my script. So he does explain it. He says, you know, if you want to rebuild this software from the source, which that's what that is, source code, you can compile it yourself. So on Windows, you need to... Um, clone the repository, the whole lot down, install this Lazarus compiler, and then it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. I've, I've never done it before, and I worked it out. Uh, what you do is you open up Lazarus, you open up this project from within the folder structure of the source files, which is somewhere here, isn't it? There it is. And then you hit play, and it will have a little think about it, Chuck out a load of errors, which I don't think mean anything really. And then in your bin directory, you will end up seeing here um, the dskew.exe, which is the latest compiled version. And I can show you that dropped in here, uh, dskew bin, and there you go. You can see that all the other versions are 2019, and this one is made the other day there, uh, yesterday actually. 
So uh, yeah, that's how you do that. Let's go back to the script. So what I've ended up doing is I've ended up creating a unified script now. So those initial scripts that I showed you, you don't actually need to muck about with that and rename the folders. You'll need to create a set of folders and then you can run this script. So this script is broken down into multiple key areas. We have the source. That's going to be referring to a folder where you put that multi-page TIFF file which came from the scanner. So you just you scan your document and you drop the file in that folder. Then you have the extracted folder. This is going to be the single pages from the source. Then you have the deskewed folder. And this is going to be using that brilliant piece of software there to deskew the extracted singular pages, make them straight, uh, white background for the backfill, and uh, hopefully make them presentable. Now this is where we got we stopped last time. Um, it dawned on me that the de-skewed files, when it has to de-skew them, if there is a significant enough slant, all of the um, dimensions change. So I can show you that quickly, actually. So if we have a look at the extracted singular pages, you'll notice they're all a specific size, which is as near as damn it to A4 at 600 dpi. However, if we go and have a look at the de-skewed versions, you'll see that all of the dimensions are different. Some are bigger, some are smaller. And that creates a problem because they're no longer A4 sheets. If you went to reprint it, you would have to muck about scaling it and all sorts of stuff. So it's not, for archiving purposes, that's not good enough, for me at least. So what do you need to do from there? Well, now you need to crop them back to A4. So there's a function within this script which will crop those um, de-skewed images based on a center point. So it works out roughly where the center is and, you know, almost like laying an A4 sheet of paper over the top and cutting around the outside, around the perimeter. And anything outside of that boundary will get removed and you'll end up with a, an A4 sheet. And I can show you that as well. So if we have a look in here, You'll notice they're now all exactly the same dimensions. And this is, um, according to Google, this is the correct dimensions for A4 at 600 dpi. Now, I haven't tested uh, anything at other resolutions here, but if we just scroll down, you'll see that there's a what they call a hash table here. And we've got 600 dpi, 300, 200, 150. And these are the correct resolutions at that dot pitch. So theoretically, you can use my script to crop um, different re uh, resolution scans to A4. Finally, once the cropping has happened, um, you, you don't want 60 singular TIFF files. That's useless to, to anyone. So you want a PDF, but also we want to make sure it's lossless. And this is the final bit of software we're using here which is IMG to PDF, which is a free bit of software that's available here. And um, that seems to be really good at doing a lossless conversion back to PDF and combining, and you end up with your finished document. So let's talk through the scripts, um, just bear with me. So for this particular example, we have this, it's a semi-global variable, it, it won't affect everything, um, but you can say which compression type you want to use. If you had a coloured document, coloured pages, maybe a glossy magazine, something like that, you would definitely be using LZW. But because the document I'm using for this video is just black and white, we can actually go ahead and use the really extreme compression, which is the FAX4. It's, as far as I understand it, it's still lossless, um, but it's just geared up for black and white images. So we can specify that here. And what you would do is just in this variable here, change that wording to be the none, LZW, etc. Now, as I say, the script is broken down into multiple sections. And um, I felt it was easiest to have switches to turn those sections on or off as needed. So if you're testing, you might only want to run uh, the first two parts. Or if you don't have anything to extract in their singular pages, you might want to just turn that off and use all of the other parts of the script. So you can just say yes, no to what you want uh, in the script, depending on what will or will not run. 
Similarly to the other scripts, you need to define where the applications are based. So uh, the if, oh, I can't pronounce these things, Irfan view, the image editor, you know. Uh, that, if it's in its default location, that's great, this is accurate. DSKU, you need to download, compile that, and put that in that location. If you choose a different location, obviously you need to specify that as well. And same with the image to PDF, I've just chucked it in here. So if we go and have a look, oh, actually, I'll tell you what, let's have a quick look at this. Folder variables, I'm just specifying where those folders are. So if we go and have a look at sort of where that all sits, you have the apps, which we've just got the image to PDF XE, and then the DSKU stuff in here. And we have that converted folder from earlier, which is the schematic. Don't need to worry about that just yet. You've got the initial source, which is, like I say, the multi-page TIFF. You've got the extracted, which will present you with the singular pages. Um, then you have the de-skewed, which will give you that. And then you have the cropped, which gives you that. And then you have the PDFs, which gives you the output PDF. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just I'll delete everything out of this. So if we get rid of that, um, bear with me, and we can get rid of that and that one. So now we have all empty folders except for the source there. And of course, we're ignoring the source one and the converted folders. Other is other stuff on my machine. As I say, you've got this hash table of the dimensions for A4 at different DPIs. Obviously, I'm using 600 and it seems to work fine. There's a little mapping table here, which is just mapping it to um, that, however you pronounce it, that ear fan view. Uh, it doesn't use the wording, it uses a number. Um, and it just creates that, that number variable there. Actually, I don't need that line. So that was just to uh, output it to console. Um, then here we go, we get into the functions. So I can talk you through these functions now. I've tried to build this script in a very modular fashion, so you could copy and paste out these functions, or if it goes wrong, you can hopefully narrow it down to one function that's playing up or what have you. Uh, and this is really interesting. If you look at the any guide online for this EarFan View uh, program, it states that the only way to change the compression setting for TIFF files that are being saved is through the GUI. Um, and if I just load it up quickly, if I can find it, I've got it here. Um, what you need to do is you need to open a document um, which, of course, I probably won't have now, will I? Uh, I can use the schematic page. We will get there. I don't know why it's... it's this is a 4K sort of laptop, so it's all a bit weird. Um, yeah. So you open a file, and then you go to Options, Settings... Settings... No, is it? So you can see this is useless. I cannot even remember myself. Ah, save as, and then you get the option to check the um, compression on here. Now, trying to explain that to people, having to fiddle about with that if you want to change it. Who wants to do that, right? We don't want to understand how that works. So I think I've done something here that nobody else has documented before. Um, which is I actually installed some monitoring software on my computer to monitor what changed when you did that. And it turns out it changes this any file or a line on this any file. So I've made a little function here, which basically, depending on what you pick in your script, so whatever you pick is the variable up here, then compared to the hash table here, or the table here, <clears throat> We'll then import into this function, and then if you use the default install, it will install in your app data, so we need a variable for the username, all that stuff. And uh, it will actually go into that any file, and it will update that line to have the number depending on what you've picked, so you no longer have to go into the GUI and 
muck about with that. So I'm quite proud of that because as far as I can tell, nobody else is, is picked up on this at all. Um, moving on, we've got the extract TIFF, and this is just a function version of what was in that script. So we've already discussed what this does. You know what that does. Um, we've then got the dskew TIFF, and again, you, you pretty much know what that does. The interesting development now is, uh, let me actually just add a line here, which is, what is it now, T input as an option. So with the new version that's come out uh, in the last couple of days, we now have this T input option, which is what I'm using. Um, basically, it means that dskew will, when it does the dskew, the output will always match the compression coming in. So you no longer have to specify which one you want for that, which is actually really useful. Um, so I'm happy about that. Then this function is going to start getting a bit, bit more complicated here. This function gets called to try and find the nearest um, resolution to your deskewed image. So like I say, they're a little bit bigger than what they should be. So it looks at that table for A4 for 600 dpi and it says, that is the nearest resolution to this image, so I will um, crop to that resolution when it comes to it. Uh, this is my crop variable, and it's, oh, sorry, crop function. And it's pulling in all of these parameters and what have you. And it will go ahead and, as I say, it's doing some pretty wacky stuff. Uh, this was, I wrote this with the help of ChatGPT and let's not beat about the bush. I, I couldn't have done it without ChatGPT um, helping with that. Although it was very annoying to try and get the answers I wanted. So you can see here it's, it's using these variables and it's going to crop to A4 simplistically. I won't bore you with that because... I don't understand it that much myself. And that is the command that does that. And finally, we've got the convert to PDF. Um, I say finally, there's one more bit actually, but um, this will take all of the files in what it's classing as its source and bundle them up and bang them in a PDF. And we'll see that working uh, momentarily. And then I say like finally, but not quite, there's a question that comes before that, and it just asks, are there any last minute changes you need to make before proceeding to PDF? Um, we'll, we'll get to that as well. Here's the main execution of the script then. And you can see I've got a lot of if statements here. So if that switch is a yes, do this. If it's not, default to LZW. Um, you know, do you want to run the extraction? Yes, go ahead. If not, just say you're skipping it. You know, so it's just, it's a very variable script, very modular. Um, and that's all that's doing. So as you've seen, all of the folders are empty now, except for the source folder. So what I can do is I should be able to actually just play this script to you and you'll see the output real time. Okay, so you can see that the script is run through and we've now got to that pause. Do you need to make any last minute changes before proceeding? And yes, we do. Um, so we should be back to what I showed you previously. Well, we've got all of those cropped pages, which we do. Um, but what you'll remember is, is obviously the physical document had the schematics at the end. And we need to add that before bundling this up. And we also need to give it uh, a name which is going to be sequential. So what I'll do is I'll just copy that last name of that last page. I'll go over to where the schematic is. We'll copy that and we'll call it 57. And then we will copy that page and go into the cropped directory. Add that page. And with that page now added at the bottom there, We've got a complete document, so we can go back to the script. 
Uh, do you need to make any last minute changes before proceeding? Uh, proceeding? So the answer is now no. So we can say N and hit enter. It's now going to try and merge that PDF and it's finished. And what we should see is we should see in the PDF folder there, I hope. Yep, there's a file. Um, now that's 3.14 megabytes. And the initial source was 2.9. And what are we saying for this? 5.91, because obviously that was uh, kind of uncompressed. So it's a little bit bigger than the initial document because it didn't have the schematic, but it's a lot smaller than even the schematic document alone. And um, yeah, that should be it. Now, 3.14 meg for a 600 DPI document, if that was uncompressed, that would be up five 600 meg. So that's stupidly small for a very, very high res document. So we can have a look at that. Uh, let me see what can I open that with. I have got Acrobat, so we'll do that. And what we should see is a finished straightened page document. Now I'm not, I don't really like this version of Adobe. Uh, fit. So we can just run through this quite quickly. And you can see everything looks lovely and straight. Um, not seeing any information cropped off anywhere. So it's generally centralized on the crop as we expected. Um, you know, I'm really happy with how that's looking. Now I could have, I could have edited that out if I wanted to in Photoshop at the pause, but not that worried about it. Now that one, you may say some of it's been cropped off there, but it's actually like that on the original. You can see where the um, staple holes is. I think it just, Sega screwed that up. And there's the money shot. There's the schematic at the end there. So uh, yeah, I'm happy with how that's all come out. So now it's on to the next step. <laughs> So I know it might not seem like it, but we are coming to the end of this process. I do promise you this video will end at some point. Um, the PDF now, we, we have one last part of the puzzle, which is what they call OCR, Optical Character Recognition. And in my opinion, what's the point in having a lovely document, lovely PDF, if it's just pictures, if you can't highlight the text, if you can't copy and paste out of it, if you can't do a control F and look for something so... Say, for example, you wanted to know uh, what the composite sync polarity was. You might just do a control F and a search for composite and scroll through the document, find where that word is, and you might find the answer very quickly. You will not be able to do that with just an image-based PDF. Interestingly, you could on a Mac because uh, Apple do this funny, like, um, on-the-fly OCR, but on Windows, as far as I can tell, it's not really a thing. And also, because it's an old document, the automatic OCR may not be perfect. It may have errors, it may uh, misunderstand what a picture is and what's text and what isn't. So we come to the last piece of software, which is a purchased piece of software, which is the Abbey Find Reader PDF. Fine Reader PDF. Uh, I've got the version 15 here. Um, and it's, it's expensive, but it's, it's not that expensive. Um, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it wipes the floor with Adobe uh, Acrobat PDF, proper Acrobat, not you know PDF reader free. Because um, I, I took that out as a trial, I ended up paying for it for a little while, and it was absolutely hopeless. It would not do what I wanted it to do. I was constantly chatting to the support team, and I got so angry about it, I just said, look, just take it, stick it, <laughs> don't bother me again. Um, so... What you can do is you could either search for the program that we want, which is the OCR editor, or usually once you've used it once, you can do uh, convert and then you can say open in the OCR editor. So I'm going to click that. And what we'll see now is this is going to open 
and it's going to start doing something pretty funky. It's going to start recognizing the OCR on the pages. And you can see it's it started here. It's created a little box around this text. You can see there's a little bit of text here highlighted for some reason. I know why, but we'll, we'll get into that. So I will just let this process run through and be back with you. Okay, and that's the process complete. Okay, so here we are looking at the process document then. And uh, I, all I've done is I've just changed the zoom to 60% just so it's a, a bit easier to try and read. So if you've never seen this interface, I'll just talk you through it. On the left hand side is the original document. On the right hand side is the OCR. So the left hand side is the original document unedited. The right hand side is digital text equivalent of what it thinks it's detected. And we've got a few buttons at the top. We've got a select, a hand tool, delete, text, picture, table. These are the most important parts. Green boxes are to identify text and then obviously it, whatever it thinks it is on the right. And we'll see what the others do as we go through the document. Now it's given its best attempt to decode everything. And if it's highlighted in that kind of light cyan blue, it's because it's not 100% sure if that's correct or not. So what it's worried about is it's thinking, is that actually what we're expecting? Now, ooh. Um, hmm, should probably have a little bit of page. So is it 15 with a dot? And yes, it is. That's absolutely fine. You can see it actually comes up larger at the bottom there, which is quite handy. And if you're happy that it's actually worked out correct, you just highlight it and hold Control T and that will confirm it is verified. So you can see I've now said, yep, that's correct. So we will go to the next page. No issues there. This page, let's just have a look. Is it highlighting all of the text? Yes, it is. Are there any issues? Nope. So I'm happy with that. Next page. So we've got one here and it's just saying, is it definitely 10? Um, yes, it is. So we can do a control T to verify that. And you just want to work through the document. We're going to have to go through every page here just to sense check everything. Um, the one, yep, it's a one dot. That is correct. So I will highlight and verify that. And now is our first opportunity to actually look at the other options here. Now, um, what it does is it, um, like I say, the green is the text and the red is the pictures. And you can see here on the OCR, the middle bit of that picture is missing. So what I will probably do is extend that. And I think you can merge them somehow. I'm trying to remember exactly how you do this now. Cut area part, add area part. Can you... Okay guys, so I've had to um, cut out a lot of the footage from yesterday. It's the day after now. And uh, essentially, I don't have a cold. I've actually got COVID. Um, I've been up all night shaking, shivering, hot, cold, all the rest of it. Um, yeah, I've been asleep most of the day. I, down in tablets. I did a test this morning, found out, tested positive. So yeah, great. I've, I've not had it before. So there we go. I suppose it was going to happen sooner than later. But I want to get this finished, so we'll we'll see how we go. Um, so yesterday I was rambling and getting a bit confused with how this software works because it's been a while. Um, but we can see here it's a bit different to what you saw a second ago. So you can see that image is now highlighted as one image. And this one I've cropped back the image and added the text areas. And I can now show you how to do that on this one as well. And on this one we can see that part of the image is actually missing so we can add that so what we can do here is we can select this picture and we can say add an area and we just want to drag and add that area in and you can see that 
has now appeared over there. So it's now recognizing that as a picture. This one here, we will actually delete the box entirely. And then what I would do is I would do the text boxes first. And you notice that over here, these boxes are currently uh, empty, which we'll explain that in a second. I will do the picture box again. And we will have to add some areas to that picture. Did I click minus by accident? Yeah. So you can see there the image is done. So now to get that text to recognize, we do recognize page, I believe, I think. Yeah, there you go. So you can see it's now picked up that text. So you can see now that um, that's successfully got all the pictures and all of the text as we want it. Um, we've got a little bit highlighted here, this 10 mil, which it is indeed 10 mil, so I can do the control T to verify that. Uh, this, yes, it's wrong, PCS, that's not what that says, it should be PCB. Um, this here, that is correct. Ooh. Um, so we can verify that. CTN1, yeah, that's correct. Flyback transformer, that's correct. So there we go. So we verified everything on it. Now, uh, I also have the opportunity to show you one other thing. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced this with PDFs. Um, you can end up with a situation, if you could start highlighting stuff, suddenly the mouse pointer jumps all over the page or it starts selecting stuff down here as well as up here. And that's due to how it's been ordered. And um, Fine Reader has the ability to reorder stuff as well, which is this button up here. And um, it's hard to see, but you might be able to see a little one there, two there, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ah. So hang on, yeah, so it's a shame. I wonder if there's a way to make this more pronounced, but yeah, you can actually see, um, I think that's eight, nine there, 10, and then 11, and then 12. So you can see some of this is out of order. So it would be better to actually reorder it. So I'm just trying to remember how to do this now. Yeah, okay, brilliant. So it works in the order that you click stuff. So let's go through it. One, two, three, four, that should be five, six, seven, eight, nine. I would probably say 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, so you can see there now that that has reordered everything correctly. Um, so it would just mean that it be when you go to um, highlight everything, it will go down in, in order. So that's uh, that's really good. So we're now on to the next page. And uh, I think that's just a, is that a bit, of, bit of dirt, I think, on the page. So that can come off. That is indeed 15. So there you go, it's going to struggle with these things. Uh, that should be the Greek symbol U, I forget what that um, what they call that, but that's obviously incorrect, so let me go and get that symbol. I mean, that's fantastic, look at that, the plus or minus, it's, uh, it's detected that symbol correctly, which is good. Uh, yeah, that is 10, so that's fine. So yeah, I'm happy with how that's uh, ordered that page. And you can see it's pretty good. For the most part, it's pretty good at getting this right. Uh, let's have a look at this one then. So here we go. We've got the, our first example of a table. It's quite nice. It's detected that text as a table. 
So basically that's um, that's the different versions now. So what I'll do is I'll just go through and I'll um, pick up if I see anything interesting. Now um, on this page it has tried to detect some of the text. I think I'd rather not bother. Um, I think I'd rather just see this all as pictures so I would just delete these um, particular boxes and then I will just make that a picture Ooh. I'll just extend that one up and the same here we've, we've got no chance of it really recognizing that of course I can't even really make out what that is so I will um, just convert that into a picture. Um, but the table's been identified. And I don't know how accurate the information is. Let's have a look. So I think with the table, it's given it its best go. Um, obviously, it's not, not perfect. It's not really right at all. Um, but it has tried its best. So let's just sort this out. And um, we'll need to, I can never remember, is it subscript, superscript? I see there's the button there, isn't it? Subscript. So we can do that. And in Adobe, you just, you wouldn't be able to do any of this. Um, because it, as far as I know, it doesn't allow you to do a side-by-side -side comparison like this. Which makes it extremely difficult to... Um, actually get this done uh, which is again why I prefer um, to use the phone reader so you see I'm just going to go ahead and correct all this um, I'll have a go at correcting this number so let me do that and come back to you okay so hopefully um, you'll agree with me that that looks a lot better than what it was I've um, corrected it all, corrected the numbers, corrected all of the uh, superscript and subscript there. So I'm pretty happy that that looks how it should do. So we can move on to the next page. Sometimes I feel like it crops these boxes just a little bit close, uh, so we just like to extend them. Like that one's just missed that number there. And we can see here it's had a pretty good stab at uh, getting this right, but it hasn't got it 100% right. What I will probably do on this one, hmm, what should we do? Let's just add in these bits, is, bits of the picture that's been missed. And we will cut out that bit of text. So, yeah, there you go. I'm, I'm pretty happy with um, how that's looking. What we'll have to do is just correct all of this information again. So I won't bore you with this because it's essentially the same process now across the whole document. Um, I've shown you all the different types of interest and I've shown you how to reorder stuff and what have you. So I'll go through and um, finish correcting up this document now and uh, be back with you once I've done that. So I just wanted to jump in on this one. Uh, we can see it's a complete mess what it's uh, tried to get from this page. And you can see why there's a lot going on here. So I just want to show one other option I haven't shown, which is uh, essentially... This has a lot of text over an image, and you can do background image, which is that. So I would just, um, I'll just do it to there for now, because I'll have to do the whole page. But you can see it's it's come across as an image, and then because it's a background image, you can then um, do the text box over the uh, text. 
So we just do a couple of these here. And then what you can do is do the recognize page. And you can see it's now detected that as real text and we'll have to go and correct that. But uh, it allows you to have the picture and uh, highlightable text or searchable text on the picture. So this is just another interesting one that I thought I would uh, show. This is basically a diagram, um, but you can see Fine Reader has decided to rotate this page because obviously the diagram is read this way, which is nice. Um, and what I've had to do is I've had to delete how it recognised it, which was just one big picture, but it is a background picture. And I just wanted to detect this text. And you'll notice that one has come out perfectly fine because I've changed it, and the other one is just like, woo, what is that? And basically all you need to do is highlight the where the text sort of sits, and then you want to do text orientation, and we will go rotated right. And when you recognise the page, uh, there you go, it's found it. It's worked out what that is. So I just thought that was... Uh, a handy thing to see and uh, what I'll do is I'll probably just detect uh, some of the text or draw some text boxes on this and uh, hopefully get that detected. So this is just another interesting one I just wanted to um, bring you guys in on. Sadly this is where this software reaches a bit of a limitation and I don't know I don't know if there's a way around it there may be because you can see here, it's sort of detected this part of the table, and it's realised that this part spans um, both columns, but it hasn't realised that this at the top spans those columns. And I don't quite know how to edit the table to um, adjust for that, because you can delete... Uh, can I get it to bring up what I want it to bring up? It's bringing it up here. Um, see, I, I didn't get that button on another table I did. Um, but you can... You can add separators or you can delete separators, but that deletes lines, um, like in their entirety. And I don't know... Split table cells, what does that do? That's interesting, isn't it? So you can get it to do that, but can you, you can't then, um, I'll just so show you, if I delete that separator, see it deletes the whole line, which is a great shame, because uh, obviously the, the rest of the table needs that. Yeah, so this to me is a bit of a limitation of uh, how it can work with tables, and uh, I wish I could find out how to go about that so it's just going to be best endeavors on these pages and i'll uh correct this information over here okay then guys um yeah it's, it's the next day now i'm having to take a lot of breaks because i'm so exhausted with everything um this morning i completely lost my voice and it's just come back in the last hour so i'm just going to try and finish this video as best as i can uh, to get it out because uh, yeah, I'm that kind of boring person. But um, once you've finished OCRing the document, you want to go into options, and on the PDF options, you want uh, I believe to say PDF A, and I'm not 100% sure on the versions, so we'll leave that on the standard one for now. You want to tick the use MRC compression requires OCR, which is what we've done. And on image quality, you want to go to custom. You want to untick that because we do not want to change the resolution. We have no need to do that. And you want to say quality loss is not allowed. So that should keep it as the inputted document was. Um, the last thing to note here is um, the searchable PDF settings. You've got text under the page image. And that will allow us to have the original document as intended shown and the OCR text sits hidden under the document and becomes selectable but you don't see it. So for archiving purposes it keeps the document as original as possible 
but gives you the benefit of being searchable. Um, I think it would be nice to understand more about bookmarks and headings, but unfortunately I, I don't know about that just yet. So what we will do is we will click OK on that, and then you'll go File, Save As, Searchable PDF, you can see here on the desktop, and I'll just put underscore searchable. And I think, does that option bring up the same thing? Yeah, it does, sort of. Um, but we'll ignore that. And uh, actually, I'll just double check, see what it does. Does it reset that? No, it hasn't. Okay, good. And then we'll just hit save. And now with that document saved out, we will minimise what we're doing here. Um, before I do that, what I've been doing is actually saving the OCR project. And that might be a good shout if you're testing different options. So um, I've already got saved, but I'll double click that to overwrite that. And I'll just minimise this. So here on the desktop, we have the document now, and it is a bit larger, um, probably due to the settings that we picked. But I'm, I'm not too worried about that. It's, it's not hugely larger. And uh, I'm just going to open that with standard Adobe now, which is the free version. And you can see we've got the document here. And uh, we should be able to scroll through it, which we can. And uh, it's the document as I originally had. But what you'll find now is, look, you can select stuff. So you could select that text, you could copy it out and um, open up a notepad, I suppose. And paste that in and there you go. That's the text pasted in. And that's what would have been appearing on the right hand side in uh, Fine Reader. That's the hidden obstacle character recognition. And of course, if you wanted to search for something um, what's a good word to search for I suppose um, tube it's a nice word isn't it and uh, there you go you can see everywhere that the word tube is mentioned in the document surely it's not mentioned just once <laughs> yeah there we go um, and that'd be really handy when you're uh, just trying to find some key information in the document. So there we go, that's the whole process. And uh, I'll just show you what I'm gonna do with this document finally now. So I've been threatening about this in my last couple of videos that um, I'll update the Wikipedia pages for these monitors that I've been uh, fixing, restoring, whatever. And um, I'm finally getting there, I really am. This is the current MS9 page, and you know, credit where credit's due, there's some good information on it, and I'm very glad that it existed. Um, but it is a little bit simplistic. It is a little bit lacking in some of the information that you could potentially put on there. So I'm currently in my own area making my own version of this page. This is the version I've come up with so far. And I'm trying to modernize it a little bit. I'm trying to standardize it. And you can see a bit like proper wiki, we've got the uh, a picture of the product, we've got the, the brand logo there. And I've scanned this in myself and done this. And uh, I'm trying to put some of the key information, obviously the years are wrong, that should be a, a range. Um, but the resolutions it supports, if it does resolution switching, what the B plus voltages should be, what the um, neck board adapter is, what came before it, what came after it. And... Uh, you can see I've just tried to put um, as much information as I can in a way that is um, readable and, you know, it's, it's technical, but it's, uh, it's useful. And uh, you can see down here we've got the service manual now. And if I click that, that brings up the document that I've scanned. And it's, uh, you know, it's searchable and all the rest of it. So that's... Um, that's its sort of final resting place. I'll put it on archive.org as well. Um, I do tend, intend to just put the schematic page up on its own as well, just in case people want to quickly look at that. Um, but yeah, that's it, guys. So 
hopefully you found that um, interesting, if not boring, but interesting maybe. And, um, you know, give me a like, give me a subscribe if you can. It's greatly appreciated. All of it, all of the support's appreciated. And uh, hopefully I'll see you in the next one when I'm a bit better. So uh, thanks for that. Cheers, guys.